sitting here with former World Chess Champion Anatoly Karpov today. So how's everything going, Mr. Karpov? I'm fine. Fine, all right. And, and what brings you to Las Vegas, uh, the Riviera Hotel, hotel today? I saw this uh, National Chess Festival, National Open, and uh, uh, it's a nice competition with a lot of players, different level. So I think they will have pleasure. And uh, so I was here 14 years ago, so this second time. Okay. All right. So I, I know um, you're probably pretty tired today. You were given a long simul yesterday. It was uh, some 24 board. There's some eight-year-old kid who was giving you some trouble. I remember till the end. Um, but how how were things going in your previous match before the simul with Yasser Sirwan? Uh, was, did it kind of provoke any old feelings, make you want to come out of retirement and start competing professionally again? It was a tough match, and uh, yes, sir, my good job, good preparation. And, uh, so we had four draws, but fighting draws, not friendly draws, not short draws. Four draws in the uh, first part of the match, which was classical chess and rapids. And then, uh, and then uh, we changed for blitz, quick games, and so we had a lot of emotions there. <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, so on the subject of St. Louis, I, I know they've made uh, huge strides towards making St. Louis uh, something like the New York or, or you know the Moscow of the West or whatnot. What do you see going on there? Do you think it's going to become a center for chess in, in the West? Yes, yeah, St. Louis uh, is a nice place now for chess. And um, so they have a uh, beautiful chess club uh, with a lot of activities, tournaments of different types. Then uh, you have uh, you have uh, Hall of Fame, uh, which is nicely presented, and uh, this performance with uh, exhibition and uh, of course world champions of all time are there. Okay, uh, so you know, on the topic of promoting chess in, in the West, and I, I know the European Union uh, recently this year, I believe it was in March, uh, made some huge steps toward promoting, accepting, and funding chess uh, as a larger role in student curriculums. How do you think the United States can achieve a parallel type of progress and success um, towards pushing chess to newer heights in, in the U.S.? So the question of uh, of uh, plans and uh, and uh, uh, how to say and the quality of education because uh, it was proven in many parts of the world that chess can influence uh, other subjects as well as math and even discipline and of course uh, chess uh, chess can be used as a tool against the drugs because chess and drugs cannot go together. Uh, absolutely impossible, and, uh, and then, so chess can become a part of uh, education and uh, a part of uh, culture and uh, general activity and general uh, uh, knowledge. Okay, so kind of uh, switching subjects here. I know you ran for the FIDE presidency a, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2010. Uh, would you be considering running for the FIDE presidency again anytime in the near future? Uh, it is quite clear that uh, you know, FIDE leadership should be changed uh, because they made many mistakes and so on. They, they missed a lot of time. And if we recall, uh, recall time of my matches with Kasparov, so chess, chess was on the first pages of newspapers and the first uh, diaries of uh, TV uh, networks. Uh, and then uh, that time we can remember where tennis was or, uh, or golf or poker. And so we can see now where tennis is and where golf, even poker. And then chess is absolutely uh, yes, absolutely no, on the bottom. And so, of course, this is uh, this is uh, bad management of chess world because chess uh, chess is still an exciting game, and millions of people are playing chess, and so you must use it. And then, uh, just recently, Fide made decision. I could say crazy decision to uh, to to get out of uh, 
uh, of uh, Chess Olympiad arbiters from the countries which uh, which supported uh, uh, court case against FIDE. And so it will happen in Turkey. I'm I'm sure it will be it will be cancelled. But still, you know, even the idea of what they brought, and this is absolutely anti-sport, anti anti peace, anti friendship, anti everything. So, what do you think about commercializing chess to, to make it more accessible to the general public? I mean, I, I know there was a huge debate going on during the, the recent 2012 World Chess Championship in the Nod and Gulf, and everybody was saying, this is the worst championship ever, it's so boring. It, what, what do you think about that? I mean, you know, Gelfin responds, I want to keep it with art and everything like that, and, and I want to keep it pure to the game. Do you feel like the time control should be shortened at all? Do you think, are, are there more ways to, to make chess more exciting? No, first, first of all, the, the whole formula is, uh, is wrong, because uh, 12 games uh, still a very short distance. So we don't uh, want to discuss even the uh, just uh, very near former time, uh, when they had four games uh, or six games, as I played with Anand in 1998. Uh, so this, this was a very bad idea. But still, 12 games also... Um, doesn't bring uh, too much space for for risk, for uh, I don't know sharp ideas, and so they were playing boring chess because they were afraid to lose one game. And then, uh, okay, if you lose one game, then it's it's not easy to to get back, and almost impossible to get back two games just to win the match. And uh, so we must think about this. And another story um, about shortening time control. Now, I don't believe in this. And we have we have Blitz, we have Rapid, and so it can exist separately. And uh, I think uh, it, it, mm, so this year we didn't have uh, um, Blitz World Championship, which is uh, pity, and I'm sorry for this. It should be done, but it's another type of chess. And uh, I remember when Campamanes, former FIDE president, started to started, started to to make uh, time control shorter, and then he was telling, "We are not on TV on TV screens because uh, chess is very long game, and so we must make it shorter." And then we shall come to uh, to uh, all TV stations. But what happened that? Uh, we lost quality of chess on the highest level because of shortening time time control, but we didn't succeed to, to come to TV. And uh, so this was just a very bad experiment, uh, which which we have to which which we have to suffer till now. Okay. All right. Um, so looking forward, who do you think is going to win the 2013 candidates tournament? And to challenge Anand in the next World Championship. Do you think Carlson's going to play? And what do you think is going to happen? No, Carlson, Carlson should, should uh, in my opinion, should be the main challenger for, for Anand this cycle. And uh, what happened that uh, also he made my decision to uh, to organize uh, candidates matches in Azerbaijan. And as I know, uh, according to all calculations, uh, Carson, uh, in this case, uh, case Carson should meet one of Azerbaijan and grandmasters, Gashima for Rajabov, and he didn't want to play with them in Azerbaijan, which is quite clear. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, uh, in our time, if he uh, almost not, does have rules. Which we had uh, for my match with Fisher, for my match with Kolchner, Kasparov. It was uh, uh, not even not even pages of uh, regulations. We had the whole book, like 82 pages, uh, and so everything was uh, was worked out very very thoroughly. And then at a certain moment when uh, Ilyumzhinov arrived to the leadership, they, they cancelled everything and they forgot about this book of uh, rules of chess, uh, of world championship matches. And uh, in that time, 
uh, you couldn't force chess player to play in the country of his opponent uh, without his goodwill and without his approval. Uh, so Carson was absolutely right to protest, and then uh, Fide uh, just kicked him out, and then they changed the place, they changed the site of uh, candidate matches. Of course, they should offer Carson to come back, which they forgot. <laughs> you mentioned your matches with, with Fisher. Uh, that stood out to me. Uh, and, and from, you know, I was kind of doing a little flashback in time watching your, your old Karpov and Fisher DVD series with Grandmaster Ron Henley. And uh, there, I, I noticed you mentioned a couple times um, that with Bobby Fisher, I guess this was around 1974, that you really wanted the World Championship match to happen with him. You met with Fisher a few times to, to try to reach agreeable terms. What happened? How 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 did the meetings go with Fisher, and why why did it fall apart? Well, meetings were okay, and so Fisher had interest to to meet uh, and to talk with me, and I had interest, and um, so we had an idea to to play match, which uh, didn't happen in 1975, and the first meeting um, took place in uh, in Tokyo in 1976. And then one month after in Spain, in Cordoba, and then we had long break, but uh, almost at the last moment when uh, I would be able to play match because uh, I had uh, that time upcoming match with Korchno, possible title which I, I had to play according to FIDE regulations. Uh, so we met uh, in autumn in uh, Washington and. Uh, so we uh, we agreed for every, almost for everything. Uh, even uh, the most uh, difficult and complicated part, number of games, number of wins, uh, the, what kind of break, and after uh, so many days or after so many games, and uh, so we, we worked out everything. Uh, only one uh, one. Uh, article was left, the title of the match. And so Fisher demanded that this match should be called the uh, match, uh, match for absolute professional world champion. Right. And uh, that moment in, uh, so it was 1977, in Soviet Union uh, uh, leaders of sport and uh, political leaders didn't want even to talk about professionalism in sport. And so I knew that uh, without uh, without their permission, I I could not leave the country because uh, that time we could not leave country without uh, Russian visa. And uh, I knew that I would not uh, be able to 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 get approval for the match. And I explained to Bobby that uh, anyway, it was quite clear that it was professional. It was for absolute world champion title. But then, at uh, that moment, he said, no, no, we sign everything or nothing. But I, I believe that he, he wasn't ready to play. And so he was trying to find uh, anything. anything just to, to say no. So what was the reaction back in Russia, back in the Soviet Union, when you were trying so hard to work things out with Fischer to determine the absolute champion, uh, whatever you want to call it? What, what was the reaction back at the Kremlin? What, what were they telling you when you were trying so hard to work things out to prove yourself and to the world that you really were the best? No, sure, they were not happy, and uh, I can say they were in upset because uh, so they uh, they were not chess players. And they had no interest for exciting match. Probably the most uh, uh, most uh, um, interesting and uh, uh, unclear match in the history of chess. Uh, and the whole chess world was expecting for this match. But uh, of course, they had risk that Russia or that time Soviet Union would lose title. Uh, even I tried to prove them, then uh, I had good chances and. Uh, so that time, I, I believe I was stronger than Fischer, uh, already in 76, 77. And at the end, I could, I could uh, get approval. When I was in Washington, so I knew that uh, I will be able to, uh, to, to get permission and uh, to make my preparation and uh, everything was, was ready uh, to, to play this match. But, uh, but uh, I, I got a lot of problems. 
and in 1976 uh, when I met Fisher for the first time, it was very bad coincidence that uh, the same day I met Fisher in Tokyo, uh, Kaishnoi, uh, Kaishnoi uh, left Soviet Union, he was in Holland, and so he asked uh, political asylum, and then uh, it was very, very bad coincidence, and uh, so chess became a part of uh, great interest of KGB, and so they started to investigate my activity, my meetings uh, with Fisher and uh, everything. So what would you say? I mean, I, I know, you know, kind of related, Korchnoi, uh, back in the day, he was kind of alleging that you were kind of like the, you were like the boss of the KGB or, or back in the Soviet Union, and he was like scared to play you or for his relatives back in Russia. I mean, it, why would he say that? What, what, what was going no, on in no, your head when he would say things like that, or other people would no, allege no, those No, I, 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 just, I just didn't think about this during, during matches, of course, between matches. I should, uh, I should uh, make my policy and uh, my position. But uh, during matches, I didn't read newspapers, I didn't listen to TV, so I was just absolutely concentrated in uh, in chess. And um, so the Western world just uh, welcomed uh, any kind of dissidents from Soviet Union. And so Polishna became dissident, and I was uh, a Soviet citizen, and so. So politically, they they were on the side of Korchnoi. <laughs> it was time of Cold War, what to say? <laughs> okay, so enough about that. So uh, somewhat related, uh, I guess you know when I when I first kind of researched and heard about this and these kind of ridiculous accusations, all this kind of stuff, I started thinking, well, this must be some kind of psychological ploy by Korchnoi to throw you off your game. How do you feel about the role of psychology in chess? I mean, I, I think it's very very instructional what you just said as far as you wouldn't even read the media or the newspapers while you play. I mean, what would you recommend for the average tournament player? How could they improve on their, their chess psychology? Concentrate on chess. <laughs> <laughs> Three words. Three words. Okay. All right. All right. So I got a couple curveball questions for you. So who do you think is the best chess player ever and why? And uh, you cannot say Anatoly Karpov. You know, I, I have, uh, even till, till now, I keep most of uh, chess records in the history of chess. And, uh, <laughs> but but I, I don't think it's the correct way to, to ask uh, who is the best. Morphy was great for his time. Uh, so he was so much better than, uh, than chess players of that time. So probably he was the greatest because he was superior much, much more than, than uh, maybe what, uh, than last year was staying its first world champion. So you must look uh, for the time when they were playing, when they were acting, when they were world champions. Uh, so it's clear that for 10 years or even maybe more, uh, I was dominating chess world and then Kasparov came, uh, so we competed for another 10 years. So it never happened in chess history. The, it's impossible such, to prove. Such competition like we had. Uh, five uh, longest matches with Kasparov is how many? Uh, 144 games. Uh, world champions never played so many games in uh, world championship matches. And we played also tournaments. So it was very long, very long, uh, very long uh, part of uh, chess life, if you consider one chess life. Okay. So impossible to prove, I guess. Yeah. It depends. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> it, <laughs> um, well, I guess it's somewhat related. I mean, you kind of just made me think about this. You know, a lot of people argue that, uh, well, no, Fisher was the best player ever, Morphe, and this, but. But in today's game, Fisher would never have a chance because of how computers have changed the game. Uh, what do you feel? Do you feel that the impact of computers on chess is positive? And uh, something that worries me is I'm like studying chess like crazy. Do you think computers are ever going to solve chess? No, first of all, I don't agree with the statement that Fisher wouldn't have chances. <laughs> Great player is always great player, and uh, even technique is, uh, I believe, in that time and uh, my time and time of uh, my matches with Kasparov, our technique was higher than technique of uh, modern chess players. So this is due to shortening time, and so they don't have, uh, they don't have uh, 
home analysis of uh, joint games and uh, so not so many games reach uh, reach the uh, final part of endings and so that's why practically they they cannot uh, develop their their knowledge and uh, their understanding uh, that's why Fisher would be great okay he he uh, he would uh, would I think he would be able he he will have to but he would be able to solve this preparation problems especially he worked very much and so he could use computers which didn't exist during the future time computer changed uh, changed the uh, way of preparation even style of uh, chess players and uh, it has positive and negative sides and as always when uh, process in progress then you have you have uh, positive and negative consequences so when i think about computers solving chess before i start freaking out and everything i think maybe chess 960 could could be a, a legitimate alternative um, if if chess becomes so exhausted by the supercomputer what do you think about chess 960 do you think it could kind of revamp the game i mean sometimes i think it's, this could help the popularity and what and the, what is 1960 chess 960 uh, fisher random chess fisher random chess uh, no i i think uh, it is idea which can exist uh, Okay, when you put uh, pieces in different starting position, you lose a uh, big part of harmony which, which chess has historically. But uh, so a separate game, uh, it's quite okay. So rules are the same, only starting position is different, but this is this is big difference. It's a separate game like Blitz. Yes, or yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I, I just want to say, what's what's next for Anatoly Karpov? What, what should we expect to see from you in the near future? So I continue to develop my system of chess school and uh, education for children. And uh, so this is not commercial program. Uh, in many countries, I have uh, good support uh, from governors, from leaders of the country, from mayors of the cities. And that's why now I have already my carp of chess schools in uh, 34 countries and uh, I think about 36 provinces of, of Russia. And so this is the whole chess, chess school empire. Uh, and I will develop this and uh, I, th I think uh, it has future. And uh, now, now federations join this, this movement. So I play for, for my interest, for my pleasure. Like I played much with Yasas Raman. Of course, I I don't uh, spend all the time now in chess preparation, analyzing chess or following chess competitions. But still, I like to play chess. I like blitz. I like rapid chess. I have less time for classical chess. And um, so I'm traveling in the world and uh, I'm trying to promote chess. And uh, so next uh, next trip will be to Corsica. This is a fantastic chess island, and uh, with uh, great chess enthusiast Leo Batesti, who developed chess in Corsica, and now in uh, Corsica is big island but small population, and so they have thousands of kids who are playing chess, and so they learn chess in school, and even when they have tournament in uh, in Bastia. Uh, the second biggest city in Corsica. Uh, then uh, children come to see, uh, come to look uh, competition, and uh, for this day they are free of school lessons, and they come with teachers to, to, to see the competition. So they, of course this is a dream for for many places. And so it will be Corsica, and I think next trip will be end of July. I go to Chile. I go to Chile to promote chess. Okay, well, fantastic. Well, the best of luck in all of your future ventures. I, I thank you for your time today, Mr. Karpov. Thank you. Uh, this is Will Stewart with OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in. Yes. Thanks for your time, man. That was great.